Hello everyone, I am Dr. Priya Sipaha. I am starting my channel Law Colleague in which I will be discussing my perceptions regarding various important topics on law. My aim is to make you familiar with the theories, statutes, law and to help you understand and develop the legal mindset. I have made an attempt to deliver useful information in an easy to grasp manner by focusing on the basics which at times are quite simple to understand. I hope the lecture series will be of interest to you and will help in understanding the concept and intricacies about the topic in discussion in an interesting, informative and effective manner. The lecture series primarily focuses to answer the questions of curious and aspiring law graduates but I hope it will be beneficial for other professionals also. My first topic is elements of crime. Now what is element of crime? To establish criminal liability, it is necessary to understand elements of crime. Crime can be broken down into elements which the prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt. There are basically four elements of crime. The first one is human being, second mens rea, third actus reus and fourth is injury. The first element of crime is human being which requires that the wrongful act must be committed by a human being. That means any non-living thing or animals are not considered in the category of a person or a human being. Where is what happened in the ancient times when criminal law was largely dominated by the idea of retributive theory, punishment was inflicted on animals also for the injury caused by them. For example, if dog bites anyone, he is punished or horse was killed for kicking a man. But in Indian Penal Code, if animal causes an injury, we do not hold the animal liable but owner is held liable for such injury. So the first element of crime is human being who must be under the legal obligation to act in a particular manner and should be a fit subject for awarding appropriate punishment. Section 11 of IPC provides that what person includes a company or association or body of a person whether incorporated or not. The word person includes artificial or juridical person. Juridical person is a legal entity created by law which is not a natural person such as a corporation created under state statutes. It is a legal entity having a distinct identity and legal rights and obligation under the law. The second and third elements of crime are derived from the famous maxim actus non facet reum nisi mens et rea which is divided into two parts. The first one is mens rea which means guilty mind and second is actus reus which means guilty act which means that the guilty intention and guilty act together constitute a crime. It comes from the maxims that no person can be punished in a proceeding of criminal nature unless it can be showed that he had a guilty mind. So the second element of crime is mens rea which may be explained in the various forms. It may be a guilty mind or a guilty or wrongful purpose, a criminal intent or a guilty knowledge and willfulness. All constitute a same thing that is a mens rea. There are three degrees or categories of mens rea. First is motive, second intention and third is knowledge. There must be combination of all the three degrees to constitute a mens rea which is necessary to establish a criminal liability in the court. Motive and intention are both aspects in the field of law and justice. Both of them are very important. They are also associated with a suspect with the purpose of proving or disproving a particular case or crime. Wrong motive with guilty intention is necessary to prove criminal liability. Motive is a ground rule of mens rea which means it is an ulterior object which may be good or bad. It also refers to the reason of a crime committed. In a psychological term it is known as the drive. For example a person may have motive to kill anyone due to revenge, jealousy, accident, fun, etc. But until and unless that reason or a motive is not implemented, it is irrelevant in determining the criminal liability. The criminal law does not concern with good motive. But now the question is why motive is necessary? 
It is so because motive is an indirect way to prove that something was done intentionally or wrongly. For instance, a defendant in an assault case may claim that he punched the victim by accident and thus did not have the necessary intent for an assault. If the prosecution can demonstrate that the defendant and victim had been arguing shortly before the alleged assault, that motive can serve as circumstantial evidence that a defendant really did intend to punch the victim. Alternatively, defendant can use the prosecution's lack of evidence of a motive as a reasonable doubt to avoid criminal liability. So that's why motives matters. But in the exceptional cases, in civil liability especially, sometimes motive is irrelevant or sometimes it is relevant also. For example, defamation, malicious prosecution, check dishonor, etc. In these things, motive is relevant. The second degree of mens rea is intention, which means an immediate act. It is a supposed action or purpose of the crime. The act is the result of intention. Therefore, the criminal law concern with the intention. Intention is relevant in determining the question of criminal liability. There is always a confusion between motive and intention. Generally, people used and consider motive and intention as a synonym, although there is a remarkable distinction between the two. Motive refers to the reason of a crime. It is a background of the suspect. And as a background, motive comes before intent. And unlike intent, motive can be determined, but existence doesn't exactly prove the guilt. On the other hand, intent is the supposed action or the purpose of the crime. It is a result of the motive and has a higher level of culpability since the harmful action was committed. Intent is characterized as a deliberate action and conscious effort to break the law and commit the offense. Intent resides in the field of law where it is defined as a planning and longing to perform an act. Now to be more specific and easy to understand, let's study the key difference between the intention and motive. The motive is hidden or implied purpose while the intention is the expressly defined purpose of the crime. The motive is the reason that drives a person to do an act or refrain from acting in a specific manner. The intention of a person can be determined by the use of particular means and the circumstances that resulted in the criminal offence. The motive is defined as the implicit cause which instigate a person to do or not to do something. But in criminal law, the term intention is explained as a deliberate cause and known effort to act in a particular manner which is not permitted by law. The motive is not the primary element for affixing culpability so it need not be proven. On the contrary, when the intention of a person is the element for affixing criminal liability, it must be proven beyond the reasonable doubt. The third element of mens rea is knowledge. It comes under the principle of ignotia juris non exequit that ignorance of law is no excuse or defense. It is a legal principle holding that a person who is unaware of a law may not escape liability for violating that law merely because one was unaware of its content. The ministry of knowledge refers to knowledge about certain facts. It is a positive belief that a state of affairs exists. The term applies if a person is aware that his or her action will have certain result but does not seem to take care. For example, if a person violently lashes out at someone, although inflicting harm may not be his primary goal. However, if he was aware that harm would be a predictable result of his action, then he is guilty of having criminal knowledge. There are three types of knowledge. First is actual knowledge, second constructed knowledge and third is imputed knowledge. Actual knowledge means when the person is clear and specific about his act and its consequences. But when a defendant does not have actual knowledge, if he believes something to the contrary. The standard is subjective and the belief of the defendant need not be reasonable, only honest. The reasonableness of the belief would be evidential in finding whether it was truly believed. There are famous cases like R versus William and Beckford versus R which explain actual knowledge in a better manner. 
second one is constructive knowledge where a defendant suspects that circumstances exist and deliberately decided not to make any further inquiries in case his suspicion prove well founded a common example is a person who purchases significantly inexpensive and unprovenant but desirable item from a stranger such a person is likely to be fixed with constructive knowledge that the item was stolen the third one is imputed knowledge this is relevant in strict liability offenses and in corporate crime for example if a bar manager delegates his duties to others and they know about the unlawful activities on the premises the manager can be fixed with imputed knowledge of the unlawful activities apart from these types of knowledge there are four levels of knowledge under criminal law which is necessary to understand clearly and separately to establish criminal liability let's discuss the four levels of knowledge the first one is purposely at this level the suspect expresses his purpose to commit a specific crime against a particular person that means everything is clear the purpose the specific crime and a victim the second is recklessly in this the suspect knows the risk involved in his actions and the situation but disregards the risk and continues to perform the crime for example if bus driver is aware about the problem in the bus but still he took the decision to drive and met with the accident it comes under recklessly third point is knowingly the suspect has knowledge and consciousness that his act will be considered a crime in the eyes of law however the suspect can inflict a crime on a person who is not his intended victim for example if a shopkeeper sells any product knowingly that it is expired he is knowingly committing an illegal act although he is not personally having any grudges with the customer the fourth one is negligently in this the suspect does not take into account various possible scenario that will happen during the action of the crime which often leads to losing control of the situation and probably causing more casualty for example medical negligence road and transport service negligence etc let's have a quick revision on mens rea as it has been discussed in the earlier slides also that it contains three degree that is motive second intention and third is knowledge now what is motive it is a reason behind any act and that reason could be jealousy lust revenge fun accident or any other reason remember motive could be good or bad motive is why person is committing any act second is intention when a person is having a motive then only he is initiated to do any act so intention is a supposed action of the act for instance if any person want to take revenge that comes under motive or reason to crime but intention includes two thing what and how that means what he wants to do to take revenge for example he might give other person hurt grievous hurt or kill that person or any other thing then the next is how he wants to take the revenge or how he wants to commit a crime maybe by giving him poison or by accident or by any other mode now the last thing is knowledge which means awareness of the consequences knowledge again has four levels purposely recklessly knowingly and negligently so motive is a reason that is revenge intention is what that is to kill the person and how is by poison and lastly knowledge is awareness of the consequences to conclude a person wants to kill someone by giving him poison due to revenge all these factors are necessary to explain and prove in the court to establish criminal liability here i would like to emphasize that the element or degree of mens rea form a basis of determining the nature of crime and consequently the basis for deciding deciding the quantum of punishment for example it is only after establishing mens rea we can differentiate between culpable homicide that is section 299 and murder section 300 which is one of the most significant topic of ipc the appropriate understanding of mens rea further helps in interpreting 
the interconnectedness of many other important sections dealing with elements of crime which I will discuss in my upcoming videos. There are many cases pertaining to mens rea. One of the leading cases are versus Prince. In this case, Henry Prince was accused of abducting a 14 year old girl, Annie, having believed her to be of 18 years old. Such an act was at that time in violation of Article 55. Prince argued that he had made a reasonable mistake in regard to Philip's age because she appears to be of 18 years old. But it was argued that the statute did not insist on the knowledge of the accused that the girl was under 16 as necessary for conviction and that the doctrine of mens rea should nevertheless be applied and conviction be set aside in the option of criminal intention. Despite his excuse for the crime, he was ultimately convicted. The Indian Perspective of Mens Rea Technically, the doctrine of mens rea is not applied to the offence under the IPC because every offence under IPC defined very clearly. The definition not only states what accused might have done but also states about the state of his mind with regard to the act when he was doing it. However, the framers of the code use the equivalent words to those of mens rea in the code very frequently. For example, section 25 describes fraudulently, 24 dishonestly, 26 reason to believe, 39 voluntarily, intentionally, etc. In Dhai Bhai Chagan Bhai Thakkar versus State of Gujarat, the Supreme Court observed and explained the law of burden of proof in insanity cases. To differentiate between culpable homicide and murder, the court depends upon the doctrine of mens rea, as I discussed earlier also. Section 292 of IPC prescribed the punishment for the sale of obscene books, possession of the obscene literature, etc., which includes ill intention. Some of the leading Indian cases pertaining to mens rea. The first one is State of Maharashtra versus Mayor Hans George. In this, it was held that mens rea by necessary implication can be excluded from the statute only where it is absolutely clear that the implementation of the object of statutes would otherwise be defeated and its exclusion enables those put under strict liability by their act or omission to assist the promotion of the law. The second one is Kartar Singh versus State of Punjab. In this, it was held that the element of mens rea must be read into a statutory penal provision unless a statute, either expressly or by necessary implications, rules it up. The third element of crime is actus reus, which is very important. Actus reus is a latent term which is commonly defined as a criminal act that was the result of a voluntarily bodily movement. This describes a physical activity that harms another person or damage property. In other words, some overt act or illegal omission must take place in pursuance of the guilty intention. There are two types of actus reus. The first one is commission and second is omission. Commission means doing a criminal act that was the result of voluntary bodily movement. This describes a physical activity that harms person or property. Person includes against the human body, which includes physical assault, murder, hurt, grievance hurt, etc. And property includes theft, decoity, extortion, etc. Second is omission. Omission means to omit or not doing its legal duty. That means as an act of criminal negligence. An omission could be failing to warn others that you have created a dangerous situation. For example, not feeding an infant who has been left in your care or not completing a work-related task properly which resulted in an accident. There are certain exceptions of mens rea and actus reus in criminal law. This includes acts that occurs as a result of a spasm or convulsion, any movement made while a person is asleep or unconscious or activities participated in while an individual is under a hypnotic terence. In this scenario, a criminal deed may be done but it is not intentional and the responsible person will not even know about it until after the fact. In IPC section 76 to 106 explains general exception of mens rea. There is a leading case Shiraz versus D. Rudson 
it has been laid down in that this case that mens rea is an essential ingredient in every offense except in three cases first cases not criminal in any real sense but which in the public interest are prohibited under a penalty second public nuisance third cases criminal in form but which are really only a summary mode of enforcing a civil right the last element of crime is injury which means injury to another person or to the society at large according to section 44 of ipc the injury denotes any harm whatever illegally caused to any person in body mind reputation or property at the end it can be said that to establish a criminal liability it is necessary to understand elements of crime and elements of crime are set of facts that must be proven to convict a defendant of a crime crime can be broken down into elements which the prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt criminal elements are set forth in criminal statutes or cases in jurisdiction that allow for common law crimes this is all about the elements of crime i hope you like the video although the current lecture has been made in a precise manner however if you wish to acquire more information and detailed notes you may subscribe my website that is priyasepaha.com i have also posted my learnings on contemporary issues on the website which might be of your interest till then goodbye and take care